Unlocking the Pauline Mysteries of the Church God's Mystery Men Plus 10 Reasons to Love the, the Apostle Paul The Apostle Paul Was Paul a mere man? Yes and no. Yes, Paul was a mere man in the flesh, just like you and me. And no, Paul was also a prominent spiritual pioneer in God's plan for the ages. He alone, by revelation from Jesus Christ, brought salvation by grace through faith to this Gentile world. We will review several passages concerning him, making a list from scripture of God's purpose for Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. But first, do we worship Paul? No, certainly not. We worship no man after the flesh, not even Jesus. Let me explain. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. 2 COR 516 KJV We, the Church, the Body of Christ, do not have a face-to-face -face relationship with the men Jesus Christ as Israel did during Jesus' earthly ministry as recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those that believed and followed Jesus in his earthly ministry were affectionately named the little flock, as Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 12 verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 12 verse 32 KJV The little flock were not Christians saved by grace through simple faith. They were Jews who followed Jesus, their Messiah, and subject to the law of Moses, as was Jesus. Christians first arrived on the biblical scene in Antioch, Syria through Paul's preaching of salvation by grace, separate from Israel and the law of Moses. Distinctly different from the traditional belief that the church began with Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 2. We Christians have a spiritual relationship with the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ seated at the Father's right hand. Having never seen Jesus face to face, our relationship is based entirely on faith and the Word of God. But how did we come to understand that spiritual relationship for this dispensation? Jesus Christ revealed it first to the Apostle Paul, as you will see. So who was Paul, originally Saul of Tarsus? He reveals himself in Philippians chapter 3. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Philippians 3 verses 5 to 6 KJV Saul, a zealous Pharisee, took pride in keeping the law of Moses and persecuting, little flock, Jews for their belief in Jesus Christ. Saul believed Jesus was a false messiah and sought to punish those who followed him. But things would take a dramatic turn as Saul traveled to Damascus in search of believers in Jesus. Let's start building our list. 1. The Unprophesied Return of Jesus Christ We begin the story of Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. And Saul yet breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Acts 9 verses 1 to 2 KJV Saul threatened imprisonment and even death to Jesus' followers. Even Jesus' twelve disciples were pursued by Saul. His zeal and hatred drove him to the synagogues in Damascus, looking for Jews who believed in Jesus. Finding such believers, he would return them to Jerusalem bound in chains to await trial and punishment. But Jesus had other plans for Saul of Tarsus, plans so startling that he could never guess what was about to happen. We continue in Acts chapter 9. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, 
And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Acts 9 verses 3 to 5 KJV In an unprecedented action, the Lord Jesus Christ left the Father's right hand, returned to earth, and hovered above Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Please understand the magnitude of that spectacular event. How many people in the Bible were honored with a unique personal visitation from God? Not many. That extraordinary, unprophesied visitation from the Lord Jesus put Saul in a similar category to Abraham and Moses. But somehow, the significance of that visitation escapes most traditional teaching. Unbelievable. Jesus returned specifically to encounter one man, Saul, on the Damascus Road. Seeing the brightness of Jesus' glory, Saul collapsed to the ground. As he lay on the road in complete shock and fear, he realized Jesus, the object of his hatred, was not a false messiah, but the true Lord of heaven and earth. It's hard to imagine what went through his mind at that moment. Had the judgment of God finally fallen upon him? Would he be killed for persecuting believers in the true Messiah of Israel, Jesus Christ? No, the Lord's grace and mercy befell Saul as Jesus instructed him what he must do. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Acts 9 verse 6 KJV 2. Saul, a chosen vessel Let's continue in Acts chapter 9 with the Lord calling one of his disciples, Ananias, to visit Saul. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus, named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for, behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem, and here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel. Acts 9 verses 10 to 15 KJV Ananias wasn't happy about visiting Saul. He knew of Saul's previous vehement persecution of little flock believers. Jesus tells Ananias that Saul is his chosen vessel to take his name to the Gentiles. That is uniquely profound. No one before Saul of Tarsus received a ministry to the Gentiles. Jesus' twelve disciples were disciples to the twelve tribes of Israel, not Gentiles. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 5, Jesus sent the twelve disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom, instructing them to go not into the way of the Gentiles, as they were apostles to Israel. Saul, our apostle Paul, would go to the Gentiles. 3. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Romans 11 verse 13 KJV. What could be more clear? Paul is the lone apostle to the Gentiles. He is not an apostle, but the apostle to the Gentiles. Here are some passages stating the mission Jesus Christ gave to Paul. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Romans 15 verse 16 KJV 
For this cause I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, Ephesians 3 verse 1 KJV. Jesus chose Paul as the lone apostle to take the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. For the first time since the fall of men, Gentiles had a distinct apostle and salvation message, the gospel of God. Before Paul, the only way for a Gentile to be saved was to convert to Judaism, be circumcised, and keep the law of Moses, thereby becoming a proselyte. But what about Jesus? Didn't Jesus minister to Gentiles? No, he did not. Jesus stated the purpose of his ministry in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, addressing a Canaanite woman desiring Jesus to heal her daughter. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15 verse 24 KJV In the four Gospels, Jesus ministered to Israel as their Messiah, not pagan Gentiles. Paul also noted the distinct purpose of Jesus' ministry in Romans chapter 15. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, Romans 15 verse 8 KJV. You and I are not the circumcision, nor the house of Israel, even though church tradition attempts to force the application of Jesus' ministry to include Gentiles and the modern church. This misunderstanding of Jesus' mission creates much error and confusion throughout Christianity. Pastors and teachers homogenize Jesus' ministry to Israel with Paul's later ministry to Gentiles, instead of recognizing their distinct differences. The circumcision is Israel. Jesus was, in his earthly ministry, addressing the nation of Israel as their long-awaited Messiah. He chose twelve ordinary men as disciples to minister to Israel, one for each tribe. Jesus later, in Acts chapter 9, chose Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles preaching the gospel of grace. Two distinct groups, Jew and Gentile. Two different ministries, Jesus and Paul's. Did any of Jesus' twelve disciples become apostles to the Gentiles? Let's read Jesus' final instructions after his resurrection. These passages address the eleven because Judas had already committed suicide, and Matthias was not appointed his replacement until Acts chapter 1. Jesus' instructions to the eleven are found in Mark chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 28. Those two passages clearly state one must believe and be baptized to be saved. Hudson Taylor, in the mid-19th century, erroneously called those passages the Great Commission in an attempt to raise money for his missionary efforts in China. Sadly, the Great Commission label has continued to this present day becoming a modern church tradition. However, the Believe and Be Baptized Gospel of Mark chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 28 was replaced in the first century by the Apostle Paul's Gospel of Grace for both Jew and Gentile, creating one new man. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16 verses 14 to 16 KJV Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Matthew 28, 16, 19-20 KJV the eleven, the eleven remaining disciples of Jesus Christ after Judas committed suicide. Remember, they are apostles to Israel. Baptism, here baptism was required for salvation. 
Jesus is instructing his disciples to baptize those that believe. But Paul said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17 KJV Baptism is not required for salvation by grace. All the world, all nations, Jews were scattered among the nations of the world. The Jew was the intended audience, not Gentiles. Jesus had already instructed his disciples, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, in Matthew chapter 10 as we have read. The instruction of go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6. Jesus never rescinded that command. The traditional understanding of Mark 16 and Matthew 28 is called the Great Commission, which includes Gentiles. If that were true, then Jesus' eleven disciples would also be apostles to the Gentiles in addition to Israel, would they not? If the above were true, then Jesus saving Saul on the road to Damascus would be unnecessary, as he already had eleven disciples going to the Gentiles. How could Paul call himself the apostle to the Gentiles, if there were already eleven others? He could not. Hence, none of Jesus' disciples were apostles to the Gentiles, nor ever claimed to be, nor were they sent to Gentiles. In Scripture, Paul is the lone apostle to the Gentiles. In summary, the so-called Great Commission, spoken by Jesus to his disciples was for the salvation of Israel lasting only a short time, during the early chapters of Acts. It was soon replaced with the gospel of grace given to the Apostle Paul by Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9. 4. First in the body of Christ The church, the body of Christ, had a definite beginning. The dispensation and gospel of grace began with the Apostle Paul as he wrote in his letter to Timothy. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 1 Timothy 1 verses 15 to 16 KJV Paul was the first to receive the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ in this present dispensation of grace, the church age. That grace was given to him after his Damascus Road encounter with Jesus. During this dispensation of grace, the Lord Jesus is long-suffering, as nearly two thousand years have passed since Acts chapter 9, long-suffering that none should perish and as many as possible be saved. Paul also stated that he is the pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul is our pattern for salvation and living in this present age, the church age. Jesus, Peter, James, and John are patterns for the Jews and Israel under the law of Moses. Paul is our pattern for living the Christian life in grace. 5. Given the Gospel of Grace but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. For I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12 KJV Paul did not receive the gospel of grace from Peter, James, or John, but by direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ after his Damascus Road experience. Other Pharisees did not teach Paul the gospel of grace, nor did he search it out in the Old Testament scriptures. Some teach that the Apostle Paul merely picked up where Peter left off in Acts. Nothing could be further from the truth. Peter was an apostle to Israel and Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul, writing in Galatians chapter 2, addresses this issue specifically. Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. 
And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run, or had run, in vain. Galatians 2 verses 1-2 to KJV 14 years after Paul's conversion, he traveled to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus to convey to Peter, James, and John the gospel of grace which he preached to the Gentiles. Paul's trip would be meaningless if Peter, James, and John were preaching the same gospel. The gospels are different else Paul's trip to Jerusalem was superfluous. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles, Galatians 2 verses 7 to 8 KJV. That passage lists two gospels and two apostleships. The gospel of the uncircumcision, Gentiles, was given to Paul by revelation from Jesus Christ. The gospel of the circumcision, Israel, Jesus gave to the eleven in Mark chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 28 as we previously read. The apostleship of the circumcision, Israel, was given to Peter by Jesus. Jesus gave the apostleship of the Gentiles to Paul, as we read earlier. Many are confused on this point simply because they do not separate Israel from the church. Since Jesus gave instructions to Peter and Paul, many assume those instructions were the same. However, they were not as our text reveals. Peter's gospel for Israel was to believe in Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, and be baptized. Paul's gospel for the Gentiles is to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, was buried, and rose again on the third day, no baptism required, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. Two different apostleships, two different audiences, and two different gospels. Paul concluded the matter with the following from Galatians chapter 2. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Galatians 2 verse 9 KJV they agreed that Paul, Barnabas, and Titus would go to the heathen, Gentiles, with the gospel of grace. Peter, James, and John would go to the Jews with the gospel, believe, and be baptized. Again, two distinct audiences, Jew and Gentile. Two different gospels, grace and baptism. Paul continues expressing the uniqueness of his gospel in Romans chapter 16 verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25 KJV. Paul uses the term, my gospel, referring to the gospel of grace he received by revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Only through Paul's preaching did the gospel of grace become known in the world. Paul adds an interesting comment in Romans chapter 2. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Romans 2 verse 16 KJV For those that live and die during this present dispensation of grace, God will judge by Paul's gospel of grace given to him by Jesus Christ. That is a bold statement. All those that preach false gospels should beware. False gospels like the prosperity gospel, the word faith gospel, the seed time and harvest gospel, the gospel of love, the gospel of the kingdom, the covenant gospel, and the Calvinist gospel will be judged by Paul's gospel of grace. Those preaching false gospels are accursed, as Paul declares in Galatians chapter 1. But though we, or an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, 
If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Galatians 1 verses 8 to 9 KJV The Lord will deal harshly with false preachers and teachers at the judgment seat of Christ if they are saved. I believe many are not saved, so they will suffer a much worse fate. The gospel of grace was given to Paul by Jesus Christ by which Jesus would create the one new man, the church, the body of Christ. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 KJV. Paul delivered the gospel of grace to the Corinthians, which he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was the first to accept and believe the gospel of grace, making him the first believer in the body of Christ. 6. Given the revelation of the mystery. Sadly, still a mystery in most believers' minds. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25 KJV. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Ephesians 3 verses 3 to 7 KJV Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3 verses 8 to 9 KJV From these verses, we read that the mystery of grace was kept secret, hidden in God the Father from the beginning of the world. It was unknown by the Old Testament prophets of Israel. No one before Paul knew of the great mystery of Gentile salvation via grace through simple faith. Let's contrast this with the ministry of Jesus recorded in the four Gospels. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, Matthew 21 verse 4 KJV. Peter speaking in Acts chapter 3. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 3 verses 19 to 21 KJV the hidden mystery program of grace is entirely different from the things spoken by the Old Testament prophets. Things prophesied and things kept secret are distinct, separate, and mutually exclusive. Otherwise, there was no mystery, and nothing was kept secret. So why was God's program to save Gentiles by grace kept secret until revealed to the Apostle Paul? Why the big mystery? But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 7 to 8 KJV For thousands of years, Satan had the godless pagan Gentiles in his back pocket. God hid the mystery program of grace from Satan and his evil minions. 
Had the forces of darkness known that God would save untold millions of Gentiles by simple grace through faith in the blood of Jesus to forgive sin, they would never have crucified Jesus Christ. They would have done everything in their power to prevent salvation by grace through faith from coming to this world. The notion of Gentile salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross never entered the wicked mind of the devil. That was God's plan. 7. Last to see Jesus Christ And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 5 to 8 KJV Many suppose the last to see Jesus on this earth were the disciples in Acts chapter 1. They stood on the Mount of Olives watching Jesus ascend into heaven. But later in Acts chapter 9, Jesus returned to arrest Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Saul was to become the Apostle Paul taking the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. Paul was the last person on earth to see Jesus. Given that fact, we should pay close attention to what Jesus communicated to Paul. There is nothing in your Bible more recent than what Jesus gave to Paul. His epistles of Romans through Philemon are the latest and greatest information for this present church age. But didn't John author the book of Revelation around 95 AD? No, he did not, and here's why. By 95 AD, John would have been painfully aware of the destruction of the temple, the ransacking of Jerusalem, and the slaughter of thousands of Jews by the Roman legions 25 years earlier in 70 AD. John would have also known of Paul's entire ministry and the new dispensation of grace. However, John mentions none of these crucial facts in writing Revelation. He writes about the soon return of Jesus and the coming kingdom. But what came from God was judgment, not the kingdom. John wrote Revelation during the early chapters of Acts, Acts 6 verses 1 to 3. 8. Paul is the last one to pen scripture, fulfilling the word of God. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, Colossians 1 verses 24 to 25 KJV. Paul fulfilling the word of God is not a reference to any prophetic scriptures about him, as there are none. To fulfill the word of God means completing the books assigned to him by the Holy Spirit. Once Paul finished his epistles, the canon of scripture was complete. Paul was the last to write scripture, not John as previously mentioned. 9. Given our doctrine Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Romans 16 verses 17 to 18 KJV Jesus gave the doctrines of grace to the Apostle Paul to give to the church, the body of Christ. But instead, the church follows bogus traditions of men originating with the Church of Rome beginning in the 4th century. Those traditions attempt to harmonize law with grace, Israel with the church, faith and works, Jesus' disciples with Paul, the kingdom program, and the grace program. Things that Paul tells us to rightly divide, to keep separate. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 KJV Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must rightly divide God's mystery program of grace from the kingdom program for Israel, by not rightly dividing the church from Israel, 
you will continue in a perpetual state of confusion, rendering yourself useless to God in this present dispensation of grace. 10. Christ sent Paul. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 KJV The next verse is the grand finale. If any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37 KJV That is one of the most misconstrued, overlooked, yet pertinent passages in the Word of God. The Apostle Paul is to us, the body of Christ, as Moses is to Israel. Moses brought the law to Israel. Paul brought the doctrines and instructions of the Lord Jesus Christ to the church. If you reject Paul's ministry, you reject the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus delivered to Paul by direct revelation the doctrines of grace, and the gospel of grace whereby the Lord is saving Gentiles. The grace program is currently in operation on earth. Israel's kingdom program under the law of Moses was temporarily postponed by God after the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Their kingdom program will resume after the rapture, at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. Then, God turns his attention back to Israel to fulfill his promises made to the fathers. So, if you are not following and participating in God's program of grace given to Paul, then you are entirely out of step with God, you are following another gospel that the Apostle Paul vehemently warns against. If you are trying to live in the red letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then you have missed God, as that program is on hold until after the rapture. If you reject, marginalize, or ignore Paul's writings, you have rejected, marginalized, and ignored the commandments of the Lord given to Paul for this present age of grace. Being confused by church tradition and the philosophies of men, you have rendered yourself blind to God's truth. Satan is the author of confusion. Believers stay confused because they regard bogus church traditions over the word of God. Do you and your church truly desire to impact your community with the gospel? That will never happen until the church fully aligns itself with the program of grace that Jesus delivered to our Apostle Paul. As long as you continue to mix and mingle law with grace, Israel with the church, faith and works, Jesus' disciples with Paul, the kingdom program, and the grace program, your church will not grow, except to produce more powerless babes in Christ and your community impact will be marginal at best, not world-changing. God only blesses and empowers His will and His purposes. You may have great programs and the best of intentions, but if you don't align with God's plan of salvation by grace delivered to Paul, then we are just playing churchianity. It's up to us. Are we going to continue with the status quo week after week? Or will we get in step with God's program, so he can work through us to reach our communities with the gospel of grace? If we don't follow the doctrines Jesus gave to us via our Apostle Paul, we are not following Christ. We remain void of his power working through us, rendering a status quo, unchanged world. The choice is ours. We can get on board with God's program of grace or we can continue to keep playing church. As our apostle, Paul would say, I beseech you, brethren, be ye followers of me, as I follow Christ. Summary 1. Christ returned Special, unprophesied visitation to Paul 2. Chosen vessel Chosen to go to the Gentiles 3. The Apostle to the Gentiles The Lone Apostle to the Gentiles 4. First in the Body of Christ The First Member of the Church, the Body of Christ 5. 
given the gospel of grace. For this present dispensation of grace. 6. Given the revelation of the mystery. Revealed to Paul by Jesus Christ. 7. Last to see Jesus Christ. Paul, not Jesse Duplantis. 8. Paul is the last one to pen scripture. Paul wrote the last scripture, not John. 9. Given our doctrine. Church doctrines of grace. 10. Christ sent Paul. Paul was sent to Gentiles, not the eleven. The Pauline Mysteries What is a biblical mystery? Why was it kept a mystery and not part of prophecy? What were the mysteries revealed by Jesus Christ to the Apostle Paul alone? A biblical mystery is hidden wisdom, previously unrevealed or kept secret. Paul writes in 1st Corner 2 verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, 1st Corinthians 2 verse 7 KJV. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25 KJV And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3 verse 9 KJV Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, Colossians 1 verse 26 KJV God concealed, via his boundless wisdom, the mystery of the church, the body of Christ, until the appropriate time for its revelation to the world. That world-changing moment came to Saul of Tarsus after his Damascus Road conversion. God finally revealed the mystery of the gospel and the dispensation of grace to save Gentiles to Saul, our Apostle Paul. Through that revelation, the church, the body of Christ began. As we cover these 12 mysteries, understanding why Paul commands us to rightly divide the word of truth will become obvious. The body of Christ is unique, entirely different from what came before it, Israel, and what will come after it, Israel. Most pastors and teachers want to harmonize the scriptures, the Old Testament, the Gospels, the Book of Acts, Paul's epistles, and Hebrews through Revelation, especially people of the erroneous kingdom or covenant theology mindset. They fail to recognize that God's dealings with mankind have changed over the millennia, as the writer of Hebrews declares in chapter 1 verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, Hebrews 1 verse 1 KJV. God dealt with mankind at sundry, various, times in diverse, diverse, manners. Those dealings are different, otherwise, the passage is meaningless. God's word is never meaningless. Those various times and diverse manners are also called dispensations. Paul commands us to rightly divide the word based on God's interaction with humanity and his designated audiences. There are two distinctly different audiences in the Bible, Jews and Gentiles. God's designated audience in the Old Testament, the Gospels, and the early chapters of Acts was Israel, his chosen people, the Jews, not the Gentiles. Only after the saving of Saul of Tarsus, our Apostle Paul, on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, does God's program begin to change. God put Israel's kingdom program on hold after their final rejection of Jesus and the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Then God introduced the dispensation of grace through the Apostle Paul to include Gentiles in his plan of redemption. God chose Saul, the Apostle Paul, to reveal his new program to save Gentiles by grace alone, and that program is ongoing. 
That program is the dispensation of grace, commonly called the church age in which we now live. We study the entire Bible, as all scripture is profitable for spiritual and historical application. However, Jesus gave the doctrines of grace for the body of Christ through Paul and Romans through Philemon, where the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile was abolished, making Jew and Gentile one new man. 1. The Mystery of Blindness to Israel During the Church Age, Romans 11 verse 25 For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Romans 11 verse 25 KJV Paul makes a clear distinction between Israel and Gentiles in that passage. Spiritual blindness came to Israel after their final and complete rejection of Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 7. Their nation diminished and God put their kingdom program on hold. A new program of grace to save Gentiles began. That program will continue until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That phrase tells us that the grace program to save Gentiles will end someday when God completes the fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles does not happen when that last Gentile is saved, as tradition teaches, but when the body of Christ is received in heaven, thus ending this present church age. Then God removes Israel's blindness continuing, where he left off in the book of Acts to fulfill their kingdom program beginning with the seven-year tribulation. The key word in the passage is until, there is a limit to the duration of Israel's blindness. We see that concept in Romans chapter 11 verses 11 and 12. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid but rather through their false salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Romans 11 verse 12 KJV Israel stumbled at the cross. They fell in Acts chapter 7, their final opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah via the testimony of Stephen before the council. Their vehement hatred of Stephen's message so angered them, that they took him outside the city to stone him to death. But their genuine hatred was for Jesus Christ, not Stephen. Thus began Israel's diminishing and subsequent fall in AD 70 via General Titus and his Roman legions. John the Baptist also addressed the fall of Israel in Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Matthew 3 verse 10 KJV The tree in that passage is Israel. If Israel did not bear fruit by accepting Jesus as their Messiah, then lay the axe to the root, cut it down, and cast it into the fire. In other words, destroy Israel as a nation. Sadly, that prophecy came true. Jesus spoke something similar in the parable of the fig tree, in Luke chapter 13 verses 6 through 9. He spake also this parable, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why come it at the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it, and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Luke 13 verses 6 to 9 KJV that parable gives us the time frame from Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 until chapter 7. The fig tree is Israel. During Jesus' three-year ministry, he finds no fruit, 
which being a national acceptance of him as Messiah. Jesus said to the dresser of the vineyard, the father, cut it down. Why should it continue to be a burden to the ground? But the father said to give it another year, and he will work with it to hopefully bring forth fruit. Then, if the fig tree bears no fruit at the end of the year, cut it down. That one-year extension of mercy began at Pentecost and ended in Acts chapter 7 with the council of Israel vehemently rejecting Jesus as Messiah and stoning Stephen. Jesus also prophesied Israel's destruction in Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to shew him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. Matthew 24 verses 1 to 2 KJV The result of Israel's complete rejection of Jesus Christ came in AD 70 with the destruction of the temple, the ransacking of Jerusalem, and the scattering of the remaining Jews after upwards of a million were killed. In Romans 11 verse 25, what happened after the blindness came upon Israel? God set Israel aside. They were spiritually blinded to their Messiah, Jesus Christ. Their nation diminished and fell while the dispensation of grace became the riches of the world and the Gentiles. The timeline for these events is pretty straightforward. Israel stumbled at the cross. They could not accept the idea that their Messiah would allow himself to be captured and crucified by the Romans. They fell in Acts chapter 7 with their final rejection of Jesus Christ and the stoning of Stephen. Thus began their diminishing. In Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus is saved, becoming the Apostle Paul, the sole apostle to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul begins his first missionary journey taking the gospel of grace to the world. Today, spiritual blindness still plagues the nation of Israel. The rabbis prepare for their coming Messiah. But they will receive with open arms a poser, a supplanter, the men of sin, the Antichrist, as their Messiah. At the midpoint of the tribulation God opens their eyes. Israel will finally realize their deception. When the fullness of the Gentiles is reached by whatever measure God uses, the presence of the body of Christ on earth will end via the rapture. The dispensation of grace and the preaching of the gospel of grace will come to a close. After which, God will resume Israel's kingdom program, where he left off in Acts chapter 7. The seven-year tribulation will begin, followed by the second coming of Jesus Christ to save the remnant of Israel, only a third will survive. The Lord always has a remnant of true believers, whether Jew or Gentile. 2. The revelation of the mystery of the gospel of grace given to Paul, Rom 16.25. Let's begin this mystery in Galatians 1 verses 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. For I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12 KJV Paul received the gospel and doctrines of grace by direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ, not from Jesus' disciples or any other men. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, Ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ephesians 3 verses 3 to 5 KJV Paul was the first to know the doctrines of grace as they were not made known to anyone before Paul received them directly from Jesus Christ. This fact is pivotal but mostly ignored by the modern church. 
Paul received a new revelation from Jesus Christ. He did not simply pick up where Peter, James, and John left off. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25 KJV. Paul described the gospel of grace as my gospel. He alone received it directly from Jesus Christ. Everyone else learned about the gospel and doctrines of grace from Paul or his letters, Romans through Philemon. Also Paul preaches Jesus Christ, according to the revelation he received, not according to Jesus Christ as characterized in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Jesus is ministering to Israel under the law of Moses. Paul is not preaching the red letters, he is preaching the mystery gospel of grace. Your understanding of the different ministries of Jesus and Paul is critical. Paul states in Romans 15 verse 8, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, Romans 15 verse 8 KJV. Jesus ministered to the circumcision, the Jews, Israel. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Jesus ministered to Israel as their Messiah under the law of Moses. Paul ministered to Gentiles under grace. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, Ephesians 3 verse 8 KJV. The doctrine of grace was given to the Apostle Paul by revelation. He did not discover that doctrine by searching the Old Testament scriptures, as the riches of Christ are unsearchable. The gospel given to Paul holds the unsearchable riches of Christ as the Lord and Savior of the Gentiles for this present dispensation. The unsearchable riches of Christ were not revealed to the fathers of Israel nor the Old Testament prophets. Jesus said the following to the Jews in John chapter 5 verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. John 5 verse 39 KJV The details about Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, can be searched in the Old Testament scriptures. However, there are also unsearchable details not revealed in the Old Testament, but revealed to the Apostle Paul as clearly stated in Ephesians chapter 3. 3. Mystery Hidden wisdom of God that grace would come to the Gentiles, 1 COR 2 colon 7 dash 8. Why the big mystery? The entire dispensation of grace was a mystery hidden in God. But why was it a mystery? Why was it not part of Bible prophecy? God had a superb reason for the mystery, found in 1 Corner 2 verses 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 7 to 8 The importance of understanding that passage cannot be overstated. The dispensation of grace, God's program to save Gentiles, was hidden in God the Father from before the world began. None of the princes of this world knew the hidden wisdom. The phrase, princes of this world, does not refer to rulers like King Herod, Pontius Pilate, or the high priest. It addresses spiritual princes, demons, fallen angels, and Satan himself. They did not know the hidden wisdom held in the power of the Father. Had the princes of this world known the hidden wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? 
Pagan Gentiles had been Satan's possession since the fall of Adam in the garden. Gentiles had been in Satan's back pocket for millennia. But now, during the dispensation of grace, untold millions of Gentiles have been, and are being saved by simple faith in the blood of Jesus Christ as payment for sin. Had Satan known that through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, millions of Gentiles would be saved, he would have done everything possible to prevent the crucifixion of Jesus. But not knowing the hidden wisdom, Satan worked tirelessly to ensure the death of Jesus on the cross. Even to the point of possessing Judas Iscariot to ensure the job was done right. Are you beginning to understand the uniqueness of the dispensation of grace, the gospel of grace, and the body of Christ? I hope so because understanding the truth will set your mind free from the confusion generated by bogus traditional church doctrines and false teachings. There is another extremely important yet seldom taught reason for God's hidden wisdom. What could be the purpose of saving millions of Gentiles by grace through faith? Paul tells us that our destiny lies in heavenly places. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3 KJV And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 6 KJV for our conversation, citizenship, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Philippians 3 verse 20 KJV. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 KJV. Our destiny is heavenly places, we are eternal in the heavens, not on the earth. The earth is Israel's domain. We are already citizens of heaven. But what will we be doing in heaven? That is a question few can answer. I have never heard a sermon on that topic either. First, let's look at the hierarchy of heavenly places. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him, and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Colossians 1 verses 16 to 17 KJV There are thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers both on earth, the visible, and in heaven, the invisible. Spiritual entities are filling those positions of authority in the heavenlies exerting influence over the leaders of the nations on earth. Some to do evil, some for good. One third of the angels filling those positions of authority in heaven rebelled against God to follow Satan. Their influence in our world is purely evil. Since the true nature of men is evil, the evil influence of fallen angels is well received. Just look at the world in which we live. Evil, violence, and corruption are everywhere. Paul tells us of the spiritual corruption and wickedness in heavenly places in the following familiar verse. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6 verse 12 KJV But the influence of evil from fallen angels is not permanent. There comes a day when Satan and his angels are removed from the heavenly authoritative hierarchy of thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9 KJV Satan and his fallen angels are cast out of heaven at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. The positions of thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers previously occupied by evil angels are then vacated as Satan, and his angels are cast out of heaven to the earth. Satan and his angels are cast out of heavenly positions of authority. The heavenly positions in question are the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers created by and for Jesus Christ. How and with whom will Jesus fill those vacated positions of authority in heaven? Paul answers that question in Ephesians ch. 1 verses 19 to 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us ward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, for above all principality, and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 23 KJV That is another passage on which you have never heard a sermon. Let's break it down. The exceeding greatness of his power, the exceptional almighty power of God over and above all else. Us ward who believe Paul is writing to the church, us, the body of Christ. We are the recipients of the exceeding greatness of God's power. Which he wrought in Christ, God's power to us is fashioned and manifested through Christ. Raised him from the dead, God raised Christ from the dead, and set him at his right hand in heavenly places, precisely where we are going in the rapture, to heavenly places. Jesus is seated far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, showing his ownership of those realms of authority. All things in heaven and earth are under Jesus' feet meaning, he has complete authority over all things. Jesus is also the head of the church that has complete authority over the church, which is his body. Jesus will give all things to the church principality, power, might, and dominion. We are the fullness of him. He will fill all in all with us, his body. We will fill the positions of principalities, power, might, thrones, and dominion in heavenly places. Praise the Lord! From heavenly places, principalities, powers, thrones, and dominions we will rule and reign with Jesus over the new heaven, the vast universe of God's creation while Israel rules and reigns with Jesus over the earth. All things will finally be gathered together in Christ, both in heaven and earth. 4. The Mystery of the Rapture of the Church 1 COR 15 51-57 Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I shew you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 to 57 KJV The passage begins with, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's you and me. Our flesh and blood bodies must be changed before we can enter heavenly places. 
Also, corruption, the decayed bodies of the dead in the grave, cannot inherit incorruption. They must be changed into new incorruptible glorified bodies fit for eternity. The present state of man's physical body is insufficient for God's kingdom and eternity. Without God's intervention in this matter, man is doomed as a physical entity incapable of entering God's heavenly kingdom. Paul records God's intervention for the body of Christ in the above passage, another mystery previously unrevealed. We have come to call this mystery event the rapture of the church. Let's review the characteristics of the rapture event. We shall not all sleep, those asleep are the dead in Christ, Christians that have died over the past 1900 plus years. We shall all be changed, all Christians, living and dead, will be changed, given a new glorified body fit for eternity. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, suddenly, perhaps without warning, in a flash, the rapture will happen. It will be over before we, or the world, realize what happened. At the last trump, this has puzzled many for a long time. What and when is the last trump? Some claim the phrase refers to the Feast of Trumpets, the last long blast from the chauffeur. But the Feast of Trumpets is a Jewish feast, not celebrated by the Church, the Body of Christ. Perhaps there is a trumpet blast immediately before the rapture, calling the dead saints up and announcing Jesus' return for his body, the Church. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, those Christians that have died over the past two millennia will be raised from the dead with new glorified bodies. We shall be changed, the bodies of Christians alive at the event will be instantly changed to a new glorified body fit for eternity. This corruptible must put on incorruption, the corruptible are the dead in Christ, as their bodies have corrupted, deteriorated, and decayed in the grave. They will put on incorruption, a new glorified body that will never die, never to see the grave. This mortal must put on immortality, mortal Christians, those alive at the rapture, will put on immortality. As with the resurrected dead saints, mortal believers also receive a new glorified body that will never die. Death is swallowed up in victory, death for the dead and living is swallowed up, devoured, nullified by our victory in Jesus Christ, having received new eternal bodies that will never die. O death, where is thy sting? The living saints will shout this as they have been translated from living to immortal, skipping the sting of death. O grave, where is thy victory? Shouted by those saints risen from the grave. The grave can no longer hold them. They are now victorious over the grave, having new eternal bodies. Their spirit, soul, and body reunited for eternity. The sting of death is sin, as the wages of sin is death. But Jesus became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. That was fulfilled for us at the cross. The strength of sin is the law the law of Moses defines sin, leaving men without excuse. Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father gave the Church, the Body of Christ, complete and final victory over death, hell, and the grave through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. After Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to his disciples in Luke 24 verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me, and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Luke 24 verse 39 KJV Jesus' new glorified body was flesh and bone, with no blood as he shed his blood on the cross. The glorified body does not need blood. The power for living comes from the Lord. The women at the gravesite, the disciples, and the two on the road to Emmaus did not recognize Jesus in his glorified body. Not until Jesus opened their eyes did they recognize their Lord. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21. 
For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Philippians 3 verses 20 to 21 KJV At the return of Jesus Christ for his body, the church, our vile bodies will be changed into a new body fashioned after Jesus' glorious body. The term glorified body comes from that passage. The second definitive passage on the mystery rapture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18 KJV Paul opens with an encouraging word to those having fellow Christians who died in the faith. Do not grieve for them as you would for a lost person whose soul is in hell. You will see those saints again at the rapture, the catching away. Jesus will bring with him those church saints that have died to be reunited with their new glorified bodies. The dead in Christ will rise first, then the living saints will join the risen dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. From there we ascend to heaven. That passage parallels the previous passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Both passages should comfort us as to whether we live or die. Someday soon, we will be with the Lord in our eternal, glorified bodies. The rapture is a mystery resurrection as we read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51, meaning the Lord did not reveal the concept through the Old Testament prophets. Also, Jesus did not reveal the rapture in John chapter 14, as some teach. The house with many mansions is the kingdom Jesus will inaugurate upon his second coming, at the end of the tribulation. These mansions are for Israel, not the church, as tradition teaches. Our dwellings are in heavenly places. John chapter 14 has nothing to do with the rapture. Jesus did not teach the rapture of the church, but Paul did several years later. Most so-called prophecy experts attempt to force the rapture into the context of the first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20. The first resurrection is a prophesied resurrection utterly separate from the unprophesied mystery resurrection of the rapture. Remember, at the rapture resurrection, only the dead in Christ will rise from the grave. Only church saints saved by the gospel of grace are raised at the rapture. Old Testament saints from Adam to the little flock are not raised at the rapture. They are raised at the first resurrection at Jesus' second coming. Jesus spoke of two resurrections in John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. John 5 verses 28 to 29 KJV In Acts 24 verse 15 we read, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Acts 24 verse 15 KJV The first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20 is the resurrection of life, also called the resurrection of the just. 
The resurrection of damnation, also called the resurrection of the unjust, occurs immediately before the great white throne judgment, after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. With the completion of the great white throne judgment, every person that ever lived has been resurrected, some to life and some to damnation. The Bible teaches for resurrections. Jesus Christ Jesus was the first person to be resurrected with a new glorified body. He is the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8 verse 29. The remaining three are mass resurrections. The rapture of the church and unprophesied resurrection, all dead church-age saints from Paul to the rapture are raised at the rapture and given new glorified bodies. The rapture is not part of the first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20, as the rapture is an unprophesied mystery resurrection. The first resurrection prophesied all godly saints from Adam to the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation, excluding the church saints taken in the rapture, are raised. At that point, all the godly people that have lived and died on this earth have been resurrected. The church saints via the rapture resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 57, and 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18. The OT saints including the little flock, Luke 12 verse 32, and the tribulation saints are raised at the second coming of Jesus Christ at the first resurrection in Revelation chapter 20. The second resurrection all the lost, ungodly dead that have ever lived on earth are resurrected immediately before the great white throne judgment. This is the resurrection of damnation for the unjust. They receive a new body only to lose it in the unthinkable second death, as they are condemned to the lake of fire. With these four resurrections, every living soul, good or bad, has been dealt with by God and their fate sealed. Please do not confuse the rapture with the first resurrection, as they are mutually exclusive events for two distinctly different groups of saints, church saints and non-church saints, OT saints, little flock saints and tribulation saints. Some deny the rapture of the church using the inane argument that the word rapture is not in the Bible. That is true for the English Bible because the etymology of the word rapture begins with Old Latin. The Latin Vulgate uses repimer from where the Middle French word rapture was derived. English borrowed the word from Middle French. Even though the exact word rapture is not used, the concept is clearly stated using the Greek word harpezo, translated as caught up in verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The context of the passage guides the study, not the presence or absence of a single word. Single words must always be understood within the context, not independent of the text. Those denying the rapture or placing the rapture within the seven-year tribulation have a grave misunderstanding concerning the church and Israel. The rapture is an actual event that relocates the body of Christ from earth to heaven, our eternal home, and precedes the seven-year tribulation. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. Trust the scriptures. Many false teachings, like the various kingdom movements and covenant theology, confuse, misuse, and abuse the word of God, seeking to justify the vanity of their false beliefs. They fail to accept the mystery doctrines of grace and the rapture, thereby leaving them no choice but to match their doctrines to Israel's kingdom program which God has temporarily set aside. Missing the dispensation of grace will have eternal consequences. Praise the Lord for the Apostle Paul, whom Jesus used mightily to bring the gospel of grace to the world and reveal a better truth for the church age. Amen and Amen. 5. The Mystery of All Things in Christ, Both in Heaven and Earth, F1 colon 7-10 In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, 
according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, and which are on earth, even in him. Ephesians 1 verses 7 to 10 KJV The key to understanding that passage is the phrase, in the dispensation of the fullness of times. The fullness of time is yet future, and will culminate after the great white throne judgment as we move out into eternity, where there will be no time as we know it. Presently, all things are not gathered together in Christ. We, the church, the body of Christ, are not yet gathered in Christ, that happens at the rapture. Israel is not yet gathered unto Jesus Christ, their Messiah, because they are still in spiritual blindness. Israel's gathering happens at the second coming when Jesus saves the remnant of Israel and gathers them into the kingdom. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew 24 verse 31 KJV The millennial kingdom lasts a thousand years, well within the context of the dispensation of times. After the new heaven and new earth, all things are gathered in Christ, because all things that exist are godly. The ungodly have been disposed of in the lake of fire. With the completion of the great white throne judgment, every soul that has lived on planet earth will have been dealt with by God. The eternal destiny of the godly and the ungodly will be settled. All the godly are gathered to Christ for all eternity. All the ungodly are in the lake of fire with Satan and his angels, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. 6. The Mystery of the Dispensation of Grace Given to Paul, F3 colon 1-5 For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, ward, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 5 KJV Today, everyone is a dispensationalist, whether they like the word or not. No one, except fundamental Jews in Israel, endeavors to keep the law of Moses. But what exactly is a dispensation? Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines a dispensation as that which is dispensed or bestowed, a system of principles and rights enjoined, as the Mosaic Dispensation, the Gospel Dispensation, including the former the Levitical Law and rights the latter the scheme of redemption by Christ. So a dispensation is a defined period through which God deals with mankind via a specific system of doctrines, principles, traditions, and customs. Webster's definition names the 1,500 years the law of Moses governed the nation of Israel under a system of doctrines, rules, customs, feasts, and sacrifices. That law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai after the Jews' exodus from Egypt. It consisted of 613 ordinances God commanded Israel to observe in their daily lives. The evidence of their faith in God was to keep his commandments. Here is a sampling of the 120 plus verses instructing Israel to keep God's commandments. From the books of the law. Therefore shall ye keep my commandments and do them, I am the Lord. Leviticus 22 verse 31 KJV Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, and his testimonies, and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. Deuteronomy 6 verse 17 KJV Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to fear him. Deuteronomy 8 verse 6 KJV from the Psalms and Proverbs That they might set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, 
Psalm 78 verse 7 KJV I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Psalm 119 verse 60 KJV He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Proverbs 4 verse 4 KJV Keep my commandments and live, and my law is the apple of thine eye. Proverbs 7 verse 2 KJV Solomon defines the whole duty of men in the following. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 KJV Jesus tells the rich man how to have eternal life. And he said unto him, Why chiest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19 verse 17 KJV The Apostle John in his writings affirms the keeping of the commandments. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. John 15 verse 10 KJV And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2 verse 3 KJV And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. 1 John 3 verse 22 KJV By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God, and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5 verses 2 to 3 KJV Those verses reveal Israel's two-pillar program of salvation. 1. Have faith in God. 2. Keep the commandments of the law of Moses, works. Included are so many verses because some say the OT saints looked forward to the cross of Christ for salvation, and we look back to the cross of Christ in the dispensation of grace. Only the last half of that statement is true. Show me one person in the OT, or the four Gospels that looked forward to the cross of Christ as the means of redemption. They looked for Jesus to rout the Romans and restore the kingdom to Israel. Israel was certainly not looking forward to their Messiah suffering and dying on a Roman cross. Israel's faith plus works program was God's standard from the Exodus from Egypt to the early chapters of Acts. Even as late as Acts chapter 11, we read, And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. Acts 11 verses 2 to 3 KJV Having a meal with uncircumcised Gentiles, as Peter did at Cornelius' home in Acts chapter 10, was against the law of Moses. Jews still considered themselves under the law of Moses even in Acts chapter 11, as that is all they knew having rejected both Jesus and the Apostle Paul. The dispensation of the law had a definite starting point. God's dealings with his people Israel changed with the introduction of the law of Moses at Mount Sinai. Orthodox Jews have always considered themselves under the law of Moses, even today. Webster defines a dispensation as follows. That which is dispensed or bestowed, a system of principles and rights enjoined, as the Mosaic dispensation, the Gospel dispensation, including the former the Levitical law and rites, the latter the scheme of redemption by Christ. Webster makes a clear distinction between the dispensations of law and grace. Webster's Gospel Dispensation was named the Dispensation of Grace by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 3 verse 2. So, what is grace? Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines grace as the free, unmerited love and favor of God, 
the application of Christ's righteousness to a sinner, a state of reconciliation to God, etc. Every sinner saved since the fall of Adam has been saved by the grace of God. No sinner can earn salvation, nor do they deserve it, God's grace bestows it. Every sinner also must have faith in God, the just shall live by faith. In OT times, the object of faith was Jehovah. Today, Jesus Christ is the object of our faith. Think of salvation as a contract or agreement between God and men. God extends grace to men. Men has faith in God. But every contract has terms and conditions. There is something else between God's grace and man's faith, the gospel, or good news. In other words, how do we exercise our faith to be eligible for God's grace? For Israel, under the law of Moses, Jews proved their faith in God by keeping the commandments. That paradigm existed from the Exodus into the early chapters of Acts. But what about now during the dispensation of grace? Grace has nullified the requirement of works, keeping the commandments, as Paul writes in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 KJV Salvation is still by God's grace and our faith, it is a gift. Works, the keeping of the commandments, are not part of the equations as Paul writes, not of works, lest any man should boast. Galatians 2 verse 16 makes it crystal clear. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 2 verse 16 KJV As you can read, the law of Moses was set aside for the dispensation of grace. The one remaining crucial part of the agreement is the gospel. The gospel defines the object of our faith and precisely what we are to believe to be saved. That is defined for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 KJV. The object of our faith is Jesus Christ. Specifically, he died on the cross, shedding his blood for the remission of our sins. He was buried and rose from the dead on the third day, proving himself the eternal Son of God, qualified and capable of redeeming mankind. Paul also states the gospel of grace is the way by which we are saved. Paul continues in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 3, stating that the doctrines and gospel of grace for this present dispensation of grace were given to him by direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not instructed by Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, but by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Paul states that the dispensation of grace was not made known in prior ages, but was first revealed to him after his Damascus Road experience. 7. The Mystery of One New Man, F2 colon 14-15 In the Old Testament, a clear separation existed between the Jew and Gentile. When did this separation begin? Before Israel's exodus from Egypt, the Lord put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel, Exodus 11 verse 7. In Leviticus, the law, God makes a clear distinction between Jew and Gentile. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, 
and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. Leviticus 20 verse 26 We see the separation of Jew and Gentile continue in the four Gospels and the early chapters of Acts. Even Peter, upon arriving at the home of Cornelius said the following in Act chapter 10. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or come unto one of another nation. But God hath shewed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Acts 10 verse 28 KJV Peter functioned under the law of Moses, still observing the separation of Jew and Gentile. However, Jesus revealed to Paul something entirely different as recorded in Ephesians chapter 2. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Ephesians 2 verses 14 to 15 KJV Jesus made Jew and Gentile one. He broke down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, making of the twain one new man. The church, the body of Christ, is the one new man Jesus Christ was and is a man, the Godman. His body, the church, is also a man, the one new man. 8. The mystery that Gentiles are fellow heirs with Israel, F3 colon 6-7. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Ephesians 3 verses 6 to 7 KJV Paul gives the purpose of the dispensation of grace. This verse speaks to Gentiles becoming fellow heirs of salvation through Jesus Christ by the gospel of grace. It does not mean that Gentiles are fellow heirs in the kingdom promised to Israel. That kingdom is and always will belong to Israel as our destiny is heavenly places. The phrase, the same body, also does not refer to the nation of Israel. It refers to what I spoke in mystery number five, all things will be gathered in Christ in the fullness of time. In Ephesians 1 verse 10, we read, That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, and which are on earth, even in him. Ephesians 1 verse 10 KJV After the millennial reign of Jesus Christ and the great white throne judgment, comes the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, then eternity where time is no more. At that point, all believers from Adam through the end of the millennial kingdom are gathered together in Christ. Both those in heaven, church saints, the body of Christ, those saved during the dispensation of grace, and those on the earth, godly saints saved before the church age, and those saved after the church age, the tribulation, and the millennial kingdom saints will be gathered unto Jesus Christ. All the godly that have ever lived are gathered to Jesus Christ to enter eternity. The ungodly of all ages were previously disposed of in the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment. That gathering is yet future. Today, all things are not yet ready to be gathered to Jesus Christ. The church has not been raptured to heaven at this writing. Israel has not yet endured the seven-year tribulation. The millennial reign of Jesus Christ is yet future. Those prophecies must be fulfilled before the final gathering of all things to Christ is accomplished and we enter eternity. Oh, happy day! 9. The Mystery of Grace Hid in God, F3 8-11 Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. 
to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in. Christ Jesus our Lord, Ephesians 3 verses 8 to 11 KJV. One reason for the mystery, as noted in section 3, was to conceal the salvation of untold millions of Gentiles by simple faith in the blood of Christ shed on the cross as payment for sin. Satan and his minions worked tirelessly to ensure the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, only to see that event become the cornerstone of Gentile salvation. But in the above passage, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, adds another dimension to the mystery of Christ. Let's quickly review Ephesians 3 verses 8 through 11. Paul begins with unto me. Jesus gave Paul the gospel and doctrines of grace, not Peter, James, and John. I know that shakes the modern church paradigm, but that's what truth has a way of doing. Read your Bible, there is much more that needs shaking. Jesus chose Paul to preach grace among the Gentiles. Paul preached the newly revealed unsearchable riches of Christ, not the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. Jesus, in John chapter 5, instructed the Jews to search the scriptures. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. John 5 verse 39 KJV the OT scriptures tell of the Messiah coming to save Israel and establish the promised kingdom. But Paul reveals the unsearchable riches of Christ about the salvation of Gentiles, not the establishment of Israel's kingdom. Israel's kingdom program will commence after the dispensation of grace closes at the rapture of the church. Then begins the seven-year tribulation to refine Israel as silver is refined in the fire, preparing them to be a kingdom of priests and kings to rule with Jesus in the millennial kingdom. The unsearchable riches of Christ are the twelve mysteries given to the Apostle Paul. The mystery of grace was hidden in God, the Father, for millennia before being given to Jesus Christ after his ascension back to heaven in Acts chapter 1. Later, after Paul's Damascus Road experience in Acts chapter 9, Jesus began revealing the mystery of grace to him. Paul would preach the mystery of grace to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. But now the principalities and powers in heavenly places can know the wisdom once hid in God, the unsearchable riches of Christ, by observing and learning from the true church, the body of Christ, and the writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul states his ministry to the Gentiles is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. We know the mystery revealed that Gentiles can be saved by grace through faith entirely separate from Israel and the law of Moses. Today, when one is saved, they are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ and are sealed until the day of redemption, the rapture. Paul wants all to fellowship with him in these truths wherein salvation is the gift of God, and our eternal destiny is heavenly places with Jesus Christ. How can the modern church be effective and powerful in the fellowship of the mystery, if grace is continually mingled with the Jewish kingdom program? Believers are perpetually confused, not knowing who they are in Christ Jesus in this present time. We are not mere sinners saved by grace, but saints of the Most High God and members of the body of Christ. As members of his body, we must understand our positional justification in Christ. Being at peace with God through Jesus' atoning death on the cross, our eternal salvation is sealed. However, our daily functional sanctification requires a concentrated study of the books and passages pertaining to this present dispensation, Romans through Philemon. Therein we discover God's will for the present and your eternal inheritance in heavenly places. Our functional sanctification gives us the mind of Christ and prepares us to rule and reign with Christ in the heavenlies. The powers, principalities, 
thrones, and dominions of heaven currently occupied by Satan and his fallen angels, shall be filled by the body of Christ after those evil minions are cast out of the heavenlies by Michael and his angels. Our preparation to occupy those positions of authority and power begins here, with our edification of the mystery revealed to Paul by Christ himself. The glory of our inheritance, given to Jesus Christ by the Father, will be revealed in our sanctification. 10. The Mystery Members of His Body, F530-32 Here are a few passages declaring us, the Church, members of the body of Christ. For we are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the Church. Ephesians 5 verses 30 to 32 KJV For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so, we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Romans 12 verses 4 to 5 KJV For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 KJV But now are they many members, yet but one body. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. 1 Corinthians 12 verses 20 and 27 KJV And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians 1 verses 22 to 23 KJV And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Colossians 1 verse 18 KJV Those passages are quite clear that we, the church, are the body of Christ. That is how all things will be gathered in Christ. The church his body and Israel, the two shall become one flesh. As members of his body, we are co-laborers with God in this present dispensation, and the world to come. What a glorious, powerful vocation and high calling as ministers of God in Christ. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 7 to 9 KJV 11. The Mystery of the Gospel of Grace, F619 And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel. Ephesians 6 verse 19 KJV The mystery of the gospel was hidden in God for millennia. No one, including Jesus during his earthly ministry, spoke of the gospel of grace. For 1,500 years before Paul, the only means of salvation was through Judaism. For Gentile salvation, they converted to Judaism, were circumcised, and kept the law of Moses, becoming a proselyte. What did Jesus say to the woman at Jacob's well? Ye worship ye know not what, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. John 4 verse 22 KJV But now salvation is not of the Jews, nor the law of Moses, but by grace through simple faith in Jesus Christ's death on the cross for our sin, his burial, and resurrection on the third day. That is our gospel, nothing else will save. During the tribulation, God reinstates the law of Moses and resumes his dealings with Israel, his chosen flock. 12. The mystery of Christ in you the hope of glory, 
Call 1 colon 26 27. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1 verses 26 to 27 KJV. Another uniquely vital aspect of the glory of the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus' Spirit is always with us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. No other group of believers before the body of Christ had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Selected OT kings, prophets, and priests would occasionally have the Holy Spirit come upon them for a specific purpose and time, but not indwell them permanently. That is why King David prayed the following in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 51 verses 10 to 11 KJV The Spirit of Christ in us desires to fulfill the following verse, if we walk in the Spirit and will of God. Romans 8 verse 29 For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8 verse 29 KJV The Father wants to see Jesus when he looks at us. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus wants to see his reflection in you. We are to continually move toward that goal with the help of the indwelling Holy Spirit, as Paul recounts in Philippians 3 verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3 verses 13 to 14 KJV The high calling of God is for us to be conformed to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Father sees the glory of Christ radiating from you. We are co-heirs with Jesus and a gift from the Father revealing his glory through Jesus and his body, the Church. Our reception at heaven's door could fare no greater than to reflect Jesus Christ fulfilling the promise, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ built up in you is your sanctification, a process wherein the Holy Spirit conforms us to Jesus' image. Christ's glory will be revealed in us, that is our hope of glory. Hallelujah! Transform your mind daily through Bible reading and study. Becoming more Christ-like should be our continual prayer and desire, as that alone leads us to walk in His Spirit and will. Only then will you know God's power and purpose for your life and be a light to others in this dark, lost world. That transformation changes your relationship with God. We can then manifest godliness and God's glory in this present evil world and that which is to come. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. 1 Timothy 4 verse 8 KJV Most churches are filled with powerless status quo Christians wanting their ears tickled and their egos stroked. Don't allow yourselves to be deluded with phony church tradition and empty lukewarm sermons. The truth is in his word. Jesus said his words are spirit. His word is alive, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Seize God's power daily through his word, only then will you be able to live in obedience to his righteousness. Creating sanctification, knowledge of God's will, and future glorification. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect will of God. Romans 12 verse 2 KJV We are to renew our minds to conform to the Bible. 
not redefine the Bible to conform to our minds. We renew our minds by the continual study of God's Word. The battle today is for control of the mind. Whatever controls your mind controls your life. Period. If you walk in the flesh, you are alive to the flesh and dead to God. If you walk in the Spirit, you are dead to the law of sin in your flesh and alive to God. Jesus said, I set before you life and death, choose life. Let the Bible speak for itself, no need for a concordance. Since all scripture was given by the inspiration of God, we need to let God speak through his word. Sadly, most Christians redefine or reinterpret the Bible to match their mind. But scripture says to transform our minds to match God's word, the Bible. That transformation will only come through serious Bible study wherein you seek God's truth, laying aside denominational dogma and church traditions. You will be amazed at what the Bible says. Remember, only the word of God is alive, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Study it, learn it, and it will change your eternal life. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you richly through his word, and may you realize your full potential in him. Amen and Amen.